Welcome to this. Uh, this is our second speaker engagement. Um, we are um, doing this all week. Wanted to remind you that this is being recorded, uh, so keep that in mind as you ask questions. And if you do have questions, uh, make sure that you raise your hand. There is a digital way to do that at the, at the top of the screen. Uh, you should be able to raise uh, your hand and then ask any questions that you might have of our guest speaker. So uh, along those lines, it is my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker. I have gotten to know him and his uh, wonderful dogs and a lot of things about uh, the company that he works for. He is with uh, Kimberly Clark uh, in Roswell, Georgia. Uh, and in addition to his IT responsibilities, he is also a Marine, a former Marine, and he works in that space with a program called uh, Salute, uh, which is there to support uh, veterans. Uh, and also he has a, a small uh, ser uh, service dog um, piece component of that on the side. So with that, it is my pleasure to introduce John De La Sala. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Greatly appreciate it. Uh, welcome. Uh, again, my name is John De La Sala. I am um, Marine, Marine veteran, and a employee at uh, Kimberly Clark here in uh, Roswell. And today I'd like to take us uh, through a um, my presentation. My goals today is to help you understand uh, who we are, uh, what we're passionate about, um, share with you our, uh, our, our approach to diversity and inclusion, uh, talk specifically about Salute, that is our employee resource group for veterans, and then at the end, uh, share with you uh, opportunities for those who are interested, opportunities uh, for how to join us. So uh, who is Kimberly Clark? Um, if you, every one of us uh, has uh, has used or purchased a Kimberly Clark product, whether it's uh, Kleenex tissues, Huggies, Cottonelle toilet paper, Scott towel, uh, we're a $19 billion consumer goods company, um, almost 150 years old. Uh, we have over 40,000 team members. We uh, manufacture in 34 different countries, and believe it or not, a quarter of the world's population use uh, one or more of our products every single day across 175 countries. Um, here's some of the uh, the products I had mentioned a minute ago, but uh, as you can imagine, uh, it uh, we have to uh, procure, convert, uh, warehouse, transport, and sell a, an awful lot of uh, paper product to generate $19 billion in revenue. Um, and what that means is that we are a um, we're a technology company more so than a manufacturer. We're a technology company that happens to make paper products. Uh, what are we passionate about? Um, we, one of our passions is improving the the well-being of uh, underrepresented and vulnerable communities, as well as reducing waste, uh, greenhouse gas emissions and the impacts on the forest. Again, we're paper based, largely paper based in our products, which means that uh, our raw materials start out as uh, trees. Along those lines, uh, our goals by 2030 is uh, we're, we will advance the well-being of, of a billion people on the face of the earth. We'll reduce our plastics footprints, footprint. We're going to reduce the uh, dependency on uh, the natural forest fiber, uh, reduce our greenhouse gases, and we're going to reduce our water footprint in uh, water stressed areas by 50%. As you can imagine, when you're manufacturing paper based products, uh, in addition to using a lot of natural fiber, you, we use a lot of water. And um, uh, water conservation is a very large part of, uh, of, of our goal. Um, social impact. Uh, our commitment is to care for the health and uh, well-being of uh, people at all stages in life. So what does that mean? It means um, as, a, as a baby, you're born and you're, you're in diapers. And uh, again, try and say this jokingly, as a, uh, as a uh, in later in the years, uh, you may find yourself back into, uh, you know, depends or adult diapers. And there's uh, many points throughout the course of your life that uh, you'll uh, you'll be touching and uh, using Kimberly Clark products. Um, 
We're going to challenge the stigmas in championing the progress of women everywhere. If you think about it from a our consumer perspective, women represent the they're the largest demographic for our products. And whether it's period products or um, other feminine care products, uh, there's uh, in some parts of the world, uh, I guess the best way of describing this is that young ladies actually can't go to school um, you know, during their, their, their menstrual period uh, because they simply don't have access to, um, to the feminine care products. And it's also um, kind of an awkward thing to talk about here, but it's, uh, it's also very important to us, and that's uh, we're changing that. That's one of our commitments. And uh, we're also championing um, a world where everyone enjoys uh, access to clean water and sanitation. And we're to also talking about toilets. Again, an awkward topic for a conversation, um, but there are parts of the world where the uh, sanitation facilities, the toilet facilities that uh, you and I enjoy are uh, effectively unheard of. Um, and that's just not right. Um, but these are some of the uh, the social impact goals that we are pas passionate about. Um, diversity and inclusion. Let's uh, talk about that a little bit. So from one perspective, uh, Kimberly Clark, like many companies, supports uh, several ERGs, employee resource groups. And an ERG is um, meant to do several things. Uh, one is to recruit, uh, retain, and develop uh, members within each of these uh, these demographics. But it's also important to give back uh, to our communities within these demographics. So uh, I happen to lead the SALUTE, which is an acronym for Service Alliance Unity Together, which is our veterans ERG, as well as the uh, Capabilities First ERG. I lead the chapters here in Roswell, Georgia for those, those two uh, ERGs. Um, the other ERGs that Kimberly Clark supports are the African American Employee Network, uh, Family Caregivers Network. Um, the FCN is focused on uh, employees who um, you need some assistance. You know, in caring for a um, you know, for a family member, be it a child or a, an adult parent, for example, uh, Asian professionals for uh, for excellence, the Latin American Network, uh, the New Employee, uh, the Neon Group, New Employee Opportunity Network, Pride, uh, Women's Inclusion Network, Parents Interactive Network, um, and I have a New Employee Opportunity Network a second time because I like it so much. Uh, but these are our ERGs that uh, we support. And uh, as you may know, many companies, in fact, most companies these days has a, uh, has, has a focus on, uh, on ERGs. Um, to talk about salutes in particular, um, our first charter is protecting those who protected us. Uh, so as you may be familiar, there are uh, uh, our population here in uh, in the U.S., uh, our veteran population is roughly seven to eight percent are our veterans, and a surprising number um, are in need of assistance. Whether it's homelessness, um, the mental health, uh, 22 veterans a day take their lives, um, and that's just unconscionable. So. Uh, one of our first charter, one of our first pillars is protecting those who have protected us. Uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, we have pillars to recruit, retain, and develop our uh, veteran members. Um, and we're also very focused on giving back to veteran causes in our communities. Uh, and that's, that's my personal passion. Um, I've been working with uh, Guide Dog Foundation and America's Vet Dogs for uh, about six years now. And uh, again, this is my personal passion and I'm very fortunate that I can um, actually bring my whole self to work. That's an expression uh, you may hear as you uh, start to look at, uh, you know, uh, investigate the opportunities. Um, but I'm allowed to, to bring my whole self to work, and that includes uh, my passion for, for service dogs. Um, this gentleman on the uh, uh, 
left hand side of your screen is uh, Joe Worley. Uh, I affectionately refer to him as Doc. He was a Navy corpsman who, uh, while assigned to a Marine infantry unit, uh, lost a leg to an IED in Iraq in 2004. And as uh, part of his rehabilitation, he was introduced to America's vet dogs and he now works for them. And in, in this picture on the left, uh, this is when Joe came to our facility in Roswell um, for Veterans Day 2019. And uh, that's a Galaxy, his service dog on the left, and that's Molly Jane, who's uh, loving on his artificial foot, uh, who was the, uh, the guide dog that I was raising, my family and I were raising at that time. Uh, in the center is, uh, I'm sitting with uh, Kimberly, uh, as the, her namesake may, uh, may indicate, she was sponsored by the employees of Kimberly Clark. We raised uh, $6,000, allowed us to, uh, to name the puppy, and I was uh, very fortunate to be allowed to raise Kimberly. So uh, this is Kimberly uh, shortly after she arrived with us uh, back in December. And uh, if I can, uh, we, have, we have some time later on in the presentation, I'll actually introduce you to her. And that's another picture of, of Joe with a galaxy on the right hand side. So why is this so important to me? Um, it's the opportunity to give back. It's something I'm, that means a great deal to me. And um, the first time you, uh, I, I, I met a person who received the first dog we raised, and this person basically told me that uh, Barney had given her her life back. Um, it it, uh, it 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 cemented uh, the importance of uh, what I'm passionate about. Um, this is actually uh, the Atlanta Athens area is actually the largest puppy raising community for Guide Dog Foundation. Uh, at any one time, there's probably 120 to 130 puppies being raised by volunteers in the area, and. Uh, uh, Pre-COVID, we were actually invited to, um, I guess back then it was called SunTrust Park, but you may recognize Blooper, uh, the Braves mascot in the background, and uh, several of us were allowed to come to the stadium and actually uh, uh, use it as a training opportunity for our puppies. Uh, for those of you who are familiar um, uh, with our Atlanta uh, soccer team, they actually sponsored uh, Spike. Um, so Spike was uh, a puppy with a purpose. Uh, and this is uh, a group of us at, the, um, at their training facility over in the Marietta area, um, again, a little over a year ago. And we were actually uh, invited to, uh, by American Airlines to go to Hartsfield Airport and uh, upwards of 30 of us were, were, uh, were in attendance. Uh, it was a great day. We actually all got boarding passes, all had to go through security, all great learning opportunities for the puppies. And uh, we gave them, uh, for almost all of them, their first opportunity to practice their skills at the airport. And, and this is uh, Molly Jane. Uh, from left to right, this is uh, Molly Jane. Uh, at work with me, doing what she's supposed to be doing, and that's uh, learning how to be uh, um, uh, unobtrusive, uh, not create, not seek attention, and not react to attention. Uh, and if you notice in the center picture, she is uh, out of vest, so she's actually allowed to be uh, more of a puppy and uh, and just socialize with people. And on the right hand side is the picture of Molly Jane when she went back to a guide dog foundation for her final round of training. And she is uh, in what they refer to as the harness that a vision impaired person um, uses when, uh, when out and about with their, their guide dog. And uh, this is actually Molly Jane and uh, Bar uh, Charlie. Uh, Charlie is the second dog we raised. He unfortunately was released he has an abnormal hip, but we were given the opportunity to adopt him and uh, they became fast friends. Um, other things that we do as part of Salute is uh, product donations. As you can imagine, um, uh, our products are uh, in high demand, especially with COVID and the shortage of uh, toilet paper and other paper-based products. 
And uh, we're very, very, very fortunate in that we are allowed to make donations of product that we that is considered uh, either obsolete or um, a closeout. Uh, so since uh, we started the program back in November, we've made donations to KSU Cares, to Cherokee Homeless Veterans, part of American Legion Post 45, to the Georgia National Guard Family Support Foundation, to uh, Project SAFE, which is a domestic violence shelter out in Athens, uh, Fountains of Hope Food Bank, which is uh, uh, in the city of Atlanta, and then most recently to uh, Champions Community. It is a, a group home for young adults with physical disabilities located here in Roswell. Um, here's actually a donation we made to uh, Cherokee homeless veterans, and uh, this is the American Legion post where uh, I think 14 pallets of product were uh, warehoused prior to being distributed. This is the uh, actual arrival of product at the um, American Legion Post. This is at Fort Stewart. We uh, we were able, very fortunate, to be allowed to donate uh, two full truckloads of product, which were then distributed across the National Guard units in the state of Georgia. Uh, this was the donation made to KSU Cares. Uh, two full pallets of, of toilet paper. Um, and that is, um, that's really the topics I wanted to cover today about uh, who we are, uh, what's important to us, um, what's passionate to uh, many of us, to me, me in particular, uh, personally, and then um, if there are any questions, I'd like to uh, to entertain them. Okay. Um, opportunities to join us. So um, we have. Um, upwards of 30 locations all across North America. Some of them are uh, mills, plants. Some of them are regional DCs. Some of them are our offices. Um, we're kind of a well-kept secret here in the Atlanta area. We have 90 acres just off of exit seven in Roswell, about uh, 25 of which are developed and for office space. But at Kimberly Clark, uh, we have opportunities in all disciplines, engineering, computing, business, marketing, finance, human resources, et cetera. Uh, and our goal is for our workforce to represent the uh, general population. Um, again, my focus on people with disabilities and veterans is to uh, personally try and help uh, folks in those demographics um, investigate and secure opportunities at uh, Kimberly Clark. We are experiencing tremendous growth. And as I believe I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, we consider ourselves a, a technology company that uh, makes essential products for life. And I believe this presentation um, will be made available, but that's the, uh, the link at the bottom there where, uh, where people can investigate employment opportunities with Kimberly Clark. And um, I am available if anybody is interested, if they see an opportunity that looks interesting, I am available to, uh, to work with uh, any and all KSU students. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, Kimberly, come here. Kimberly, I'll be right back. So this is Kimberly. She is a uh, standard poodle. In fact, let me turn off the uh, the background effects. I think you'll be able to see a little bit easier if I do that. So this is Kimberly. She is a standard poodle. She's not quite six months old. Uh, she will be a seeing eye dog and uh, Guide Dog Foundation works with uh, labs, with Goldens and standard poodles 
And uh, the, re the reason they even work with standard poodles is for uh, vision impaired people who have allergies or asthma. Uh, they can't have a, a golden or a lab in their home. And uh, my wife and girls have allergies, so that's, all, that's the reason we can only work with the poodles. Uh, they're an incredibly intelligent breed. Um, a lot of character too, a lot of personality. So uh, Kimberly, our namesake, will be um, changing somebody's life in about another year and a half. Uh, it takes about two years uh, and it costs around $55,000 to uh, fully raise and train a, a guide dog or a service dog. Ordinarily, she's a little more animated, but I think she's had a rough day. Um, that's everything I wanted to cover. Again, if there's uh, any questions, I'm more than happy to address them. There, there was a question for you. Um, somebody was asking about if they could um, connect to you. Let's see, let me uh, pull up the exact one. Uh, yeah, connecting on LinkedIn. Is Absolutely. That okay. So I'm not sure if my, um, I, I'm probably the only John Della Sala out there. Uh, I know I'm the only John Della Sala at Kimberly Clark, but uh, I would, uh, I would accept, I will accept any invitations on LinkedIn. I was going to ask a question. Um, if nobody else had a question about how often you get a new dog. Um, around every two years. So it takes about, um, we have the dogs for about 18 months. Uh, with COVID, it's impacted how the dogs are actually distributed and assigned to the handlers. Um, Pre-COVID, the, the, the chronology or the, the path or journey is the puppies are bred at the guide dog kennels up in New York. They're kept for about two months. They're assigned, distributed to a, a, a puppy raiser. As I mentioned, the Atlanta Athens area is the largest puppy raising community for guide dog. Uh, that razor has the dog for until the dog's about 18 to 20 months old, at which time they would return to the campus. They'll be assigned to a professional trainer who will work with the dog for about three to four months. And at the end of that, the handler, that's the person who'll be getting the dog, is uh, flown to New York. They meet the dog, live uh, with the dog in the dormitory for two weeks and the handle every day the uh, handler, the trainer, and the dog go out and do final training. And then the, uh, there's a graduation ceremony and the handler and the dog are flown home, all free of charge to the handler. Um, due to COVID, uh, things have changed. So uh, the, uh, the employees at Guide Dog are actually traveling around the country. Uh, they bring the dogs to the handler. Um, so that means that the, there's a fewer number that we, we keep the dogs a little bit longer uh, because there's only so many trainers that can physically go out and actually stay for a week at the uh, at the handler's location. Um, the other question I was going to ask, maybe even on behalf of um, students or anything uh, with, with regard to hiring, because I know that Kimberly Clark is such a large company. Uh, it, it basically just touches every aspect. It, uh, I'm, I'm sure there's room for just about every major uh, that we have at, uh, it, within Kimberly mm -hmm. Clark. So do you have an advice for them on what might make them stand out a little bit more or uh, any anything with regard to uh, the do's and don'ts of interviewing? Um, the do's. I think I'm going to put her down because uh, she's getting heavy these days. Uh, so some of the do's is, are um, do your research. Um, I think it's extremely important to come prepared for the uh, the presentation, and you want that person who's sitting across the uh, either the table or the video screen from you. Um, uh, you want to differentiate yourself. You don't want to be one of many, and. It is not that difficult to do some research to, to learn about Kimberly Clark. Uh, to include some topical information, some, you know, some, uh, what's our most recent acquisition? What are our products? Um, and, and, and you can name drop, right? You can talk about 
um, you know, about Kleenex, about Huggies. Uh, it, it's not that difficult to, to learn about uh, where do we manufacture. Um, we have mills across the, uh, we have 14 mills in the, in the United States. Uh, so that's one of the first things I would do is learn something about the company. And you don't want to do it just uh, to be phony. Uh, you want to do it because you're actually interested. And quite honestly, if your research indicates that, you know what, what I'm seeing is something that doesn't interest me, well, that's a good truth teller. Uh, on the other hand, if what you're seeing is something that intrigues you, excites you, and you think you could be, uh, you could forge a career here, then let that come through in the interview. So the first, the first do would be to, uh, to do your research. Uh, and again, it's not very difficult to do that. Um, the second is, I think there's always a challenge when you're a recent college graduate because you're, um, you don't necessarily have that work history behind you. And a lot of times the work history you have, I have a, a my youngest is about to graduate in just a couple of weeks. And we spent a lot of time working on her resume. And one of the things you need to um, really do a little bit of uh, personal inventory, take a personal inventory of yourself in terms of you know what are your true strengths. Uh, and I'll be a little facetious here. You know, uh, you don't want to come out and say you know I'm a people person, uh, to use an old expression. Uh, you really want to be able to articulate you know, what are some of the things you've done some of the challenges that uh, you've, you've taken on. Um, again, that's really important to differentiate yourself. Uh, I used to give uh, some presentations at local schools and uh, I had a couple of slides, one of which would say, um, I am a, uh, a graduate of, uh, of XYZ University uh, with a degree in uh, computer science and I am fluent in you know these six languages and the response quite honestly is you know that's nice so are 20,000 other people um, if on the other hand you know you, you articulate something along the lines of I am extremely interested in opportunities at Kimberly Clark because um, I've done some research and I really like I am intrigued I am interested in some of the work you're doing here and um, again, you've got to complete the rest of that sentence, but there's two very different presentations. One is where, uh, you know, you're not unique. You haven't differentiated yourself. And the other is where um, you will stand out. Um, as far as the don'ts, um, I, I don't know there's enough time, uh, but I would, uh, I would suggest let common sense rule the day. Uh, if you really think about uh, what things, you know, you know, don't be late. Um, it's probably the most important thing. Um, and do um, everything from, you know, your appearance, your demeanor. Um, uh, do make a good impression. Uh, you will not be the only person being interviewed for that position. And if you think about it, your resume has a, a life expectancy of uh, measured in seconds, right? Because what happens when there's an interview process, there's usually several people who will be interviewing you. They all get a copy of your resume along with several other resumes. Uh, they go through it. Uh, this is what I will do. I'll go through with a highlighter and a red, and a red pen. I'll uh, highlight the things that I want to ask about, I want to learn more about. So uh, you need to ask yourself, what are you putting in your resume that's going to get somebody's attention, that's going to make them you know, want to ask you more about that? And role play it, literally role play it. If they ask me about this, because um, what you're doing is you're trying to set the, you know, to use an expression, you're setting the hook, right? You want them to see, you know, see your resume and ask you more about that. Um, Jeff, well, I could probably go, go on with uh, several other things, but I think those are the most important things that come to mind right now. Actually, um, Andrea, if you want to just ask a question, uh, feel free if you've got a mic.
or or if you would like, I can I can read the question. How about this? I'll I'll go ahead and read. Oh, she said yes. It has some issues with her microphone, so I'll go ahead and uh, and read this. It says uh, these are great do tips. I'm at KSU pursuing a, pursuing a drastic career change. How can I relate my old career certified medical assistant of 13 years to a new career after obtaining a BS in cybersecurity? Asking in terms of compiling a new resume, would you suggest a cover letter for someone in my situation? Cover letter is always important. Cover letter. Um... So I heard several questions. For, let's take the last one first. Yes, and you should have multiple cover letters because the, the messaging in the cover letter uh, really should be employer specific. And uh, you should have um, combine that with the research that you're doing. Right? You, you don't want to have a, a, a generic cover letter will be recognized as a generic cover letter within seconds. If on the other hand, you've done some research and you can actually incorporate that research into your cover letter and a cover letter you know, should sound something along the lines of um, you know, very excited about the opportunity, very interested because I don't just say I'm very interested, very grateful. Um, you know, again, set the hook. This is why I'm interested. Um, I think the first question you asked was you know, how to leverage experience. Um, you have experience. It may not be in cybersecurity, but one of the things that um, I would assume uh, about your experience is that you've had responsibility, maybe a, a great deal of responsibility. Um, and that's one of the, uh, that's something that's hard to, uh, to measure, right? So on one hand, you're competing you know, with, with, uh, with other people. Uh, but it sounds like you may have a, a distinct advantage in terms of being able to articulate some of the challenges that you, uh, you were presented with, some of the responsibilities you accepted. Um, I think those are unique differentiators. Does that help answer the question, Jeff? I don't know if she's she can respond back through the chat. Yeah, and I, I'd probably throw one extra thing on. Yeah, she says yes. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, one of the other things that I would do is, you know, people like kind of what uh, John was saying here, if you go through resumes and that's part of your job, you can spot a generic cover letter almost instantly. Uh, and that that definitely is a deterrent unless there's some super um, outstanding other aspect of the of the packet that's been submitted. That generic cover letter kept cover letter is just not a good thing. So. Um, I, I can speak from an academic uh, standpoint. You know, we get 150 people that are applying for a tenure track position, um, and you're just going to see it. And if it's generic, it's very easy to spot. So that research that John was talking about is really good advice. Um, I would throw out one extra thing, um, just from from what I've seen. A lot of folks, uh, especially because my son's going to go through this relatively soon as well. Uh, you can't phrase things in terms of I like, why do you want this job? Well, I need a job or it's about me. Uh, you try to put it in in terms of the of the company. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if you would agree with that, John, but it's kind of refreshing oh, yes. to hear somebody where their their priority is say, hey, I recognize that you have the job and uh, I'm here to help the company. So those are those are refreshing things uh, to hear on the other side. Um couldn't agree more. Some of the things that I've coached my children about is are um, uh, I like hearing expressions such as um, I'm excited to apply my craft, my chosen craft, my chosen trade. I'm looking forward to the opportunity um, to actually um, you know, apply what I've been learning to drive value into my you know, to my employer. Uh, if you really think about it, at the end of the day, um, you know, that's what it, that's what it, what it comes down to: is are you going to add value to the employer? And you know, just to put a dollar sign in front of it. Uh, value is typically helping them sell more and spend less. So one of the things that you may want to think about is, you know, how do you achieve that? You know, if you're going into cybersecurity. Um, I think you I think it applies to both. If you're working for a company that has a uh, very strong track record in cybersecurity, 
then prospective clients are probably uh, you know, not concerned about using their credit card to buy online because they're not concerned that their information is going to be hacked. Um, at the same time, if you know, you're, you're part of a, a well-designed architecture, cybersecurity architecture, um, you'll get the job done for less. Right? So um, uh, those are two important points that I always try and focus on you know, to sell more and spend less. And if, for example, you're, um, you know, you're, you're a computer engineer, a software engineer, uh, you may have a hard time to, to make that connection. Well, I'm a software engineer for you know, General Motors. Um, how is my work going to help them sell more vehicles? And you know, that can be a challenge, uh, but it can help them spend less by increasing efficiencies, um, you know, it, 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 it decreasing waste. So you know, give some thought to that. Uh, you know, other areas that are always important are going to be um, you know, mitigating risk, right? So uh, I would say a third category after uh, sell more and spend less is you know, of risk avoidance. So is your discipline, is your craft, is your skill, and most importantly, is your passion what you want to do with your education? Um, you know, does it align with selling more, spending less, risk avoidance? Um, you know, you need to answer those questions. You know, if your, you know, if your value add is again very generic, is um, I'll be a little facetious here. You know, if you're a COBOL programmer in 2021, um, you know, you're you're probably going to be supporting a uh, a very old system. And one that is, uh, you know, you know, probably on its last legs. So I don't know if that's going to help you sell more or spend less. It might be, you know, more risk avoidance until they can they can you know, do away with it. If on the other hand, you know, you can articulate um, again with a sense of passion, right? And you should have passion about it. You should be passionate about uh, the effort you put into it, the success you've had in school. The excitement about uh, applying it, applying your craft, applying your trade, your chosen trade, and I use those words very, uh, very specifically. And you might consider doing the same because uh, I think it will differentiate you and also creates a sense of, um, you know, uh, fire inside of you, that passion about what you, what it is you want to do, and it'll come across in the in the interview. And I'll say one other thing, Andrea. It is it is fairly common for um, for folks to be career. We call them career changers, and that's a, that's a pretty common thing. So don't don't let that deter you from uh, from living your dream and going into this field, uh, because there's there's a lot of space that's out there that needs good professionals in cybersecurity. So, um, all right. So new message. Let's see. Uh, understood. Makes sense. Thanks for helping see it from your point of view uh, and yes i'm extremely passionate about my new field which is which is wonderful to hear looks like amy is typing let's see that is good advice okay well um i guess with that uh if you guys have any any more questions uh go ahead and type them in but uh but if not thanks everyone from from andrea um John, uh, thanks for taking the time to talk with us today. Uh, and also, uh, you know, on behalf of our students and, the, and KSU Cares, uh, it's wonderful what you did for uh, with that donation. That's a, that's a huge deal to us, and it really does impact our students. So, thank you for your work with uh, Salute. Uh, thanks for your help with our students, and uh, we we love collaborating with you. Uh, and so, with that, I guess I'll uh, I'll let everybody go back to their day and uh, have a wonderful uh, evening. Take care. Thank you so much.